Imagine you are seven years old. You've been playing outside, throwing rocks at the wall. Your dad had already told you to stop when he walked past, but you ignored him and just carried on throwing your rocks. And then it happened. One of the rocks bounced in the wrong direction, hitting your dad's bedroom window. And it shattered. You know that you are in a lot of trouble. Your heart freezes as you hear his voice calling out to you from that broken bedroom window. You know what's next. Everyone knows what's next. So you walk with your head bowed in shame to your dad, who meets you outside of his bedroom door. Then he asks you to follow him as you walk in the direction of the garage. You're thinking, here it comes. I am going to get the hiding of my life. But then, as you get to the garage, the most unexpected and unlikely thing happens. Your dad reveals a gift. A brand new bike just for you. So today is Father's Day and you've tuned in for week three of our series called Parables, where we're looking at short jam-packed stories that Jesus used to teach the people around him and introduce this new kingdom that he's bringing, as well as explain the upside down working of God's kingdom. And then lastly, to leave us, his audience and the people around him listening to these stories with an option and an opportunity to make a decision. He wanted to invite them into God's new kingdom. And the parable that we're looking at today is so profound because I think it reveals the heart of the Father like none of the other parables do. It tells us about His extravagant love for you and for me. So let's dive in. In this story, Jesus is busy sharing it to a specific group of people. And what Luke does brilliantly is he's placing the setting well. He's telling us who's the crowd, who's the guys listening to Jesus right now at this moment. So I want you to read with me. It's in Luke chapter 15. That's where we're going to spend most of our time today. And Luke starts it off like this. He says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And in these two verses, Luke is giving us a few clues. He's telling us some important things. Firstly, he tells us who's the audience that Jesus is busy sharing this story that we're going to be focusing on today. Who's he teaching? And then also what triggered him to start speaking about what he's going to be speaking about. So firstly, the audience. In his audience, there are two groups of people. If I can give them names, I hope I'm not offending people here, but they are kind of in this group, the outsiders, the tax collectors, the sinners, the guys that is really standing on the outside to what God is busy doing in the nation of Israel, being against what God is busy doing, the outsider crowd, the rebels. And then on the other side, there is the insider crowd. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, those guys that were like really committed to what God is busy doing through the nation of Israel, they would be seen as insiders, be part of what God is doing. And it's what they say that triggers Jesus to start speaking about the heart of the Father. They say that, and accuses Jesus actually of the following, they say, Jesus, this man, he welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Jesus hears it, and he immediately starts with a series of parables, talking about things that went lost. Now, he kicks it off with the story of the lost sheep, and we all know that the shepherd leaving all 99 sheep behind to go after that one. And then he continues, and he goes on to this Big, big parable, a parable that we all know so well, called the parable of the prodigal son. And he dives into what it means to lose something and then how far the father is willing to go to get that back. So I'd like to invite you in 
As Jesus walks this crowd through this story, I'd like to ask you to journey with me through it. And let's dive in as we look at what Jesus had to say. Verse 11, Jesus continues. He says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now in these two verses, I think we should just like get a cup of tea, sip, and just think about what's happening here. We can so quickly read over them and really miss how they would hit the original audience. And if we think about it, hit us. What Jesus is busy saying here is he's saying there is a father who had two sons. And his youngest son came to him and asked him, Dad, can I get my share of the inheritance now? Do you know what he's busy saying? When the original audience heard this, it would have been like, oh, what? That's, that's the reaction that they would have had. And in fact, if you sit down and think about it for a moment, that's kind of like our reaction as well. I mean, if you just ask the question, when do someone get their inheritance? Well, the answer is quite clear. You only get an inheritance the moment you die. You get someone's inheritance. When someone else that leaves your inheritance behind, they need to die. So in essence, this younger boy is coming to his father and he's saying, Dad, you know what, I'd rather wish you be dead now because I'm more concerned with the stuff that I can get from you than what I am concerned with you. What an insult. And if we think that is shocking, what Jesus said next about the Father would have like, like dropped the mic moment. Everybody in the house would be quiet right now because the crowd would have expected the dad to literally throw this boy out with physical blows, out of the house, disown him. How can you even say or think that? Uh, probably a modern crowd would be thinking the only reason why a boy or a child would be doing that and have that attitude towards their parents is probably because this dad is a mess up. He's a drunk and he's probably going to stand up now and hit his boy just to prove how bad he actually is. But Jesus does not reveal any of that. In fact, he says, this father did the unthinkable. He took his estate, he divided it into three, and he willingly gave a third of his estate to his younger boy. Can you imagine that for a moment? Think about it for yourself. Imagine you would take everything that you have now, all the wealth, your house, your car, your savings, divide it up into three and give a third willingly away. You would become a third poorer and you would give it to a rebellious son because the story continues with this younger boy and it says that he went off into a far country and he spent all of the inheritance. He squandered the wealth that he had from his dad to the point that he had absolutely nothing left. And then finally, he realized all I have left to give is literally what my dad gave me as well. Just this life, the air in my lungs. It's because of my dad that I'm alive today. I was born because he played a role in that. And then he decided, well, maybe I should just sell that as well. And he went to someone to sell off, to become a hired servant, a hired hand in this foreign country to a stranger. And the story tells us, Jesus tells us the following. He says, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating while he's being hired by this guy, by the stranger. And then it says, but no one gave him anything. Here is the younger boy, this father's son, giving literally his whole life away to a stranger that wants him to starve to death. Guys, when I'm looking at this picture, I'm thinking about sin. Isn't it so that sin promises us the world, but leaves us with nothing? This stranger that invites us on a journey to give away everything we have, even our life, and then ultimately leaves us just to die. I believe it's something we can all recognize with if you've walked that road, if you've walked the road of the younger brother, the rebel, 
you've probably been where he is right now in that story. It was also in this moment that he thought back of how good his dad was. It was at this moment that he was thinking back about how well his father would treat the servants in their house. And he thought to himself, well, what if I could just go back? And if I could just go and work in my dad's house? I'm no longer worthy to be a son, but I could maybe work my way back and become one of his servants. That would be better than what I'm experiencing right now. So he packs his bags, gets himself ready. He's on a long journey back home. And then Jesus tells us that this dad actually sees the boy coming from far off. And he does what no father would have done in that time. He would actually reveal his legs. He would lift up his cloak. He starts running. One of the commentators says that this dad is acting like a mother in that time. It would have been so dishonoring. A patriarchal father, the the head of the family would never do this. But something in this father's heart is just compelling him and he runs to his son and his son starts explaining and he's saying, I am unworthy father. I do not deserve to be your son anymore. I'm convinced I'm only worthy of being a slave. Isn't that what sin does? When you've sinned, you feel you're not worthy. You're overwhelmed by the fact that you're not good enough. You need to work your way back and you kind of like, talk to God about it, and you start explaining, saying, I'll be better. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do everything right. And what does the father do? He replies. He looks at the son. He says, no ways. You're not working your way back. I'm bringing you back. He looks at his servants. He says, guys, go and get the best cloak. Get the best robe we have. You know what robe that is? That's the father's robe. Go and get my robe. Dress him in that. Give him a ring. And then dress him in sandals. And then if that's not enough, go and slay the fattened calf because my son was dead. He's alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. We need to celebrate. That is what the father is doing in this moment. That is his heart being revealed. Now, I don't think we really get what's happening here. So I want to try and put it in our context. Imagine today you had a expensive bottle of wine. I mean, I'm not talking about just a nice wine. I'm talking about one of those wines that you would sell at a wine collection for about 10,000 Rand, one of those bottles. Really, really special. I mean, and you've been saving it up, or maybe your dad had been saving it up, depending on where you are in life, but been saving it up for that special occasion, you know, for that anniversary or for that massive big birthday or, or maybe for the birth of a grandchild. It's that kind of a bottle. And the next moment, your son arrives back home and says, Dad, I'm sorry, but I wrecked your brand new Mercedes Benz. Do you think that's a time when you reach for that bottle? And you say, guys, let's celebrate. No. Or your daughter comes back home and tells you, Dad, I've flunked out of school. I've given up on education. It's over. I messed up. Do you take out that bottle now? No. It just doesn't make sense. But that's exactly what this father is doing. His boy is returning back home and he's saying, Dad, I messed up. Dad, I messed up. And his dad says, Slay the fattened calf. Let's party. My boy is back. This story is called the story of the prodigal son. And I never knew this. I've discovered it while preparing Being English as my second language, growing up in an Afrikaans world, I always just thought prodigal would mean run away. But the word prodigal actually means to extravagantly, lavishly, recklessly spend everything you have. That's what the word prodigal means. And this parable is called the prodigal son because of the way the son would spend his inheritance in a very radical way. But when we look at the story Jesus is telling, and when we come to this point, we need to stop and ask the question, who is truly the prodigal one now? Because the way this father is acting is showing that he is radically spending. Jesus is busy speaking to the outsiders. I believe 
At this very moment, Jesus is looking to the outsiders listening today, the rebels, the guys that's run away, the guys that's been saying, God, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I just want your stuff. Just give me a cool life. I just want whatever I want, and I'm going to do with it what I want to do with it. Jesus is saying, you know what? There is a new kingdom, and in this kingdom, there's a father that is willing to spend everything that he has to get you back home, to bring you back into the family. That's the love of this dad. The story doesn't end there. It continues with the older brother, the brother that stayed behind, the brother that everybody in the community thought, this is the guy. This is the hope for the family. This guy. I mean, just look at how he loves his father. He's staying true to the family. He's really honorable in his way of life. And Jesus tells us that this older brother comes back from the field from the day's work. He's on his way, coming to join. And then from afar, he hears music playing and he realizes there's a party going on. Inquiring from one of the servants what's going on, he finds out that his dad has slain the fattened calf. He's having a party because his brother, his rebel brother, yeah, the one that like dragged their family name through the mud, he's back. And his dad is not having it in for him. Instead, his dad is inviting him in. And he's throwing a party. Whole community's invited. Then Jesus tells us that the older brother gets angry immediately. So angry that he throws a fit and he refuses to join the party. How embarrassing is that? I mean, the whole community is there to celebrate with this dad. And the one guy that everybody thought was with dad is now the one guy that embarrasses his own father. So much so that the father had to come out from his festivities. The master of this feast had to leave his guests and come and plead with his son to join. I've never understood why this boy was so angry, but the reality is, is if you think about it, for his younger brother to come back as a brother, it meant that he had to be assigned a portion of the inheritance again. So this younger brother, this older brother realizes everything that he was working for now needs to be given up. And in this moment, the heart of the, the older brother is tested. Does he love like his father loves? So the father pleads with him, asks him to come in. But he answers his father in verse 29. He says, look, dad, all these years I have been slaving for you. And I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a little goat to celebrate it with my friends. But my brother, that has squandered his inheritance, you slaying a fattened calf for him. You know what he's saying at that moment? I find two things very profound. That even the older brother, just like the younger brother, both of them saw themselves as unworthy slaves and not sons saying, I've been slaving it all for you, Dad. But also that both of them never really loved the Father. They never wanted the Father. In fact, he's making a statement. He's in this moment accusing his dad of not loving him. He said, Dad, you don't love me. And you know what I would have wanted the dad to do at that moment, what we all would have wanted him to do? We would have wanted him to look at his oldest son and say, well, you never wanted me. You just wanted my stuff. That's what it looks like. But this is not any dad. This is not any father. This is a prodigal father. And he replies as follows. He says, my son, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. And in this moment, the father speaks to his elder brother, the insider, the one that thinks I had proven myself. I need to work for my father's approval. Here's 
the real gift that he's always had was to be with his dad. And that everything his father has is his. How lavish, how big, how abundant. To all the insiders, I believe Jesus is saying, no matter how many good things you could have done, no matter how hard you work to earn God's love, it's impossible to do that. Because God already loves you. You cannot earn his love. It's given freely, and he proved it by sending his son to die even before you were born. So stop trying to earn it. Embrace it. It's a free gift. Jesus ends this story off with a cliffhanger, asking the insiders and the outsiders, where are their hearts? Is it connected to the Father's heart, this abundant, recklessly giving heart? Or is it consumed with self? He says the following. He says, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was lost, who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And in the statement, he's actually asking a rhetorical question to you and me, saying, is your heart broken for what my heart is broken? Are you looking for those who are lost just as I am looking for those who are lost and want to bring them back home? See, I believe if I can quickly sum it up and just end off with this, the outsider's picture of God's love looks like this. The outsider would say, for God so loved the world that whomever would never sin shall not perish but have eternal life. God gave his son that if you would never sin, that's kind of the outsider's view. And the outsiders would think, well, I've already done so many bad things. God could never love me. The insider's picture of God's heart and his love is the following. They would say, for God so loved the world that he gave all the good people an opportunity to prove themselves worthy of God's love. Luckily for us, in steps the son, the true son, the son that had the same heart as the father. And he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So that if you would believe in this radical love, this prodigal God, this reckless, extravagantly giving love father, you will be saved. You will have new life. So I'd like to take a moment and just pray for you. If you were an insider thinking you need to prove yourself worthy, may you today discover that you cannot earn his love, but you have received it. If you're an outsider thinking that it's too late for you, may you realize and hear God's words, the Father running to you saying, I'm bringing you back. You're not working your way back. If that's you, I want to ask you, won't you open up your heart to the love of our Heavenly Father? Let's pray. Father, you know the hearts of those who are listening. You know them even better than they do themselves. And God, as we hear about your radical, extravagant love that calls us and invites us to become sons in your house, to celebrate with you. In Jesus' name, I come and pray. Holy Spirit, may we surrender to your love and allow that to define us. Not our past, not our hard works, but only your finished work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've come to the end of our time together. And um, as I've mentioned, today is Father's Day. And dads, if I can give you a word of encouragement, uh, a, a beacon of hope, a place to look towards, it would be this. Look towards the love of the true Father. Imitate Him. 
and trust God to love your children as He loves you. We've prepared a little video for you guys just to say thank you and and we appreciate you and we appreciate that God made you for this specific role. So as you sit back and enjoy this after that, I'd just like us to pray for our dads. So enjoy this video. Dad, what about me makes you proud? Oh, man. Um... Dad, what about me makes you proud? Dad, what about me makes you proud? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Dad, what about me makes you proud? And I have to answer that one? Yes. <laughs> Just about everything that you do. You're loving, you're funny. If I could go on and on. <laughs> what makes me proud about you is you just being yourself. I had trouble with alcohol. It was actually an intervention. Even with all the other people there, you were the, the real reason that I made the decision to go into the treatment center that I did. And uh, thank you. Thank you. You're helpful. Yeah. You forgot the funny part. <laughs> your attention to uh, hygiene. <laughs> Dad, I am grateful to you for choosing to stay when I was little. Mm -hmm. um, why am I crying? <laughs> At the time when I'm graduating and I'm packing up and leaving, then it's really going to hit me. And I think about a time when if you're not around, like that would be awful. <laughs> but like you're the you're the person that would always laugh. Dad, I'm grateful because we didn't know how long you were going to be with us, so we're so happy that you're still here. Dad, I'm proud of you for knowing that the most important thing was to just give your kids so much time. I've always been impressed by you. You made it easy. Thanks. I miss having the chance to just check in with you. I miss your sketchbooks. I love you. I love you too. You got it. We don't say it enough. Mm. Hey. <laughs> I love you, Dad. <laughs> it doesn't compute until they're gone. <laughs> so tell them now. Sort of weird standing so close to you. <laughs> <laughs> what a special video. While you have your dad, maybe your dad is there around with you in the room, I'd like to invite you to sit close to him now, maybe put your hands on his shoulder as we're going to pray for our fathers and just trust God's blessing to be over them. Let's pray together. Father, Thank you that you created dads. You've given them the opportunity to take up a role that you've modeled so beautifully. And Father, I come and pray that your spirit would strengthen our fathers to walk in your ways, to align our hearts with your heart, to see sons and daughters and the house standing up into the calling that you have created them for. May they lead their houses in the way you lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.